Okay. So, um, I'm just going to, like I said, get started again after those technical difficulties. So, we're talking about functions. Why are functions important? Well, they're important for reusability. Again, my favorite topic in programming. Um, this is our second foray into re reusing code. And you don't want to copy and paste over and over again. Um, we used loops last week, and now we're using functions. And most importantly, you can now give it a name. And when you give it a name, you actually turn it from just a block of code that can be reused to something that is named that can be reused. So the fact that we're giving it a name allows Python to take that block of code and store it someplace, and we can use it later. Just like when we have a variable, and we you know, put a value into that variable, Python stores that, and it, you can go back and get that again and again and again. Well, the same thing with a function. We've given it a name, so we've given Python the, op the opportunity to store that block of code for later use. So a function is simply a grouping of code, and that we've given a name, and that can be called from anywhere else that knows about that name so it can get to that block of code. We're going to be talking about scope in a little bit. And so that's what I'm really talking about, called from the wider code, is really talking about where and what the scope is, where you can find it. So part one, defining a function. One of the, inner, the suggestions I got on YouTube last week was maybe instead of just generic examples, I could use the challenges for examples. So that's what I'm doing this week. Please let me know if you think this is um, a good idea. And I'm sorry, ignore the .pys down here. They'll all be challenge underscore, in this case, 5.1.1. So what do I have in front of me? Well, what I have is a function definition. Challenge 5.1.1 says um, you're going to define a function called print pattern, which prints five characters. And you're going to call print pattern twice to print the characters, to print 10 characters. Now, there are two parts of a function. There are defining it, and there are calling it. The definition is what Python takes and kind of drops into a bank of functions that it can reuse later and later and later. Just like print is a function that we use, print underscore pattern is a function that we can use in a similar way. So what do I have here? First of all, I have the word def. D-E-F is a keyword. And it tells Python not to immediately execute the code inside the function, but to register the function for later use. So that's what def does. And after def, you have to have the name of the function. And the name of the function has similar rules to naming a variable. So if you can make a variable name out of it, you can make a function name out of it. Then we have the block, the function block. That's the code inside the function. And again, it's a block, so that means it's indented to the right at least one time. Um, so that nodes it's a code block, plus you need the colon. So we have parentheses. If you have def, at a minimum, you have to have an opening and closing parentheses. Even if there's nothing in them, at a minimum, that's what you have to have. And don't forget the colon. Again, colon is not our friend always, but just like with if statements, if, else, elif that have blocks of code inside them, and loops that have blocks of code inside them, patterns have blocks of code inside them. So you have to have the colon. So this is part one. This is defining the function itself. Um, function declaration starts with the keyword def function requires opening and closing parentheses. So now we're going to number two. Number two, or part two, is how we call the function. 
So right now, got just what I had on the other page. I've got print, sorry, def, print underscore pattern, and then it's just going to have print five characters. So I can call a function. I can call a function by its name, and in this case, just opening and closing parentheses, just like I use the input function. It's no different except I define this. I created it. So print pattern, what it does is, first of all, this is the function call. Print pattern calls, it tells Python, hey, Python, go out, find this defined function called print underscore pattern, and do whatever is supposed to happen inside that function. So at the moment that this is called, Python will say, okay, I'm going to go find print pattern and I'm going to execute the block of code that's in print pattern. So in this case, the output's going to be five stars. And then I decide I want to call it again. I can do that and call this as many times as I want. So again, it's a function call. We have print pattern. Python's going to go find print pattern. And then it's going to go run print pattern, and I'm going to get another output. So let's go out and take a look at this in PyCharm. Is everybody good with the sound quality right now? I'm not seeing any chat, so I'm hoping that that's the case, but we're all good. Okay. I'm just going to assume we are. Okay. So... This is 511, and it's print pattern. Okay, great. So this is 511, challenge 5.1.1, and it is the print pattern. The only thing I did differently here is in line 6. Instead of just saying I'm going to call print pattern twice, I kind of wanted to show that I could put it in a, in a, a loop and call it as many times as I want. Um, so it's I have print patterns, my function. I have the block of code. Now, a block of code can be as many lines as you need. And then I have the beginning of the for loop and the print pattern. So I'm just going to put this back to two here. Now, the thing to remember is that Python doesn't stop here. It only will say, okay, I have a definition. So I'm going to store something. I'm going to store whatever the lines of code are under it in, a, in an area that's named print pattern. So if I put this into debug, you will notice that it does not stop at line 3. Line 3 is a block of code inside the function. When I first start it, it stops at line 6. So Python ignores line 2 and 3. Well, it doesn't ignore line two. Line two is just like, okay, this is the name, put it away. So line six is the first executable line of code at this moment. So I just have four I in range two, and I'm going to call print pattern twice. So I'm going to step over line six. I'm going to get to line seven. Now, here's a new thing in the debugger we haven't used, which is step into. Step into says, I want to go and look at what's happening in the code block for this function. You use step into for functions. And this is very handy because you're going to have to write a function or two for your project. So when you need to debug it and you want to go into the function, you put step into. So now I called print pattern. It took me to line number three, which is the first line in the block of code in print pattern, and then it prints it out right there on the console. So if I do this again, I'm going to call print pattern. Sorry, I'm going to go up to the top of the loop. I'm going to I by one. I'm going to call print pattern. I'm going to go back up to line three. I'm going to print it out. I'm now going to be at the end of my loop, and I'm going to end. So that is what is happening in Python. So let's go to here. That was, oops, I go to the wrong place. No. Okay. So that was the 
part one and two. Part one is defining the function. Part two is calling the function. Well, a function is in fact what we call a black box. A black box is just that. When you're calling that function, let's just take the print function, for example, that Python gives you. I don't know what that function does. I, I don't know what all the lines of code are. I know what I want that to do. I want it to print out the way the things that I want to print out in the way I want them printed out. But I don't know what the lines of code look like in the print function. Never actually gone and looked because I don't need to. So that's an example of a black box. I don't know how many lines of code are in, in that function. Um, and frankly, as long as it works, I don't care. But I do have to have a way of getting information into the function and getting information out of the function. A woman I worked with many years ago who actually was a triple PhD in math, I kid you not, used to call them goes intas and goes outas. So the goes intas are what we're going to talk about now. And they are parameters. A parameter is just a variable that is in the scope of the function only, and we're going to talk more about scope later, but it's only available to the function. It's not available to the wider program. And it allows whoever's calling that function to pass in information that that function can act upon to do something with. So. For challenge 5.2.3, it says define a function called print total inches. Um, it's gonna have, it says with parameters, so number, num feet and num inches, and then it's going to print the total number of inches. It says there are 12 inches in a foot. I don't know why you have to tell people there are 12 inches in a foot, but I won't go on any more of a soapbox. So def is used. If you see in your Zybooks lab, define a function, and then like print total inches, then you're going to use the keyword def, and you're going to give it whatever the function name is. Okay? Don't name it something different if, Python, if Zybooks gives you the function name. It might not like it. So I have a function named called print total inches. That's the name I'm going to, I'm giving it, and so that's the name I will call it. Now remember, probably don't need to, but I'm just going to say cases and spaces matter. So these are case sensitive. Function names, just like variable names, are case sensitive. So I have two parameters here. I have num feet and num inches. They're just variable names. There's nothing special about them. They could have been A and B. They could have been Fred and Ethel. It doesn't matter. They're just variables. Because they are defined as part of the function call, they're called parameters. And they're a way of getting information into the black box. So always separate your parameters with a comma. So. The, the code block in this instance is two lines. It's calculating the total inches and printing the total inches. Um, and so num feet is going to be used inside that code block, and num inches is going to be used inside that code block. So a parameter is a variable that exists only inside the function. The value of the parameter is provided by the function call. So let's go and look at that function call. So this is the second part of defining parameters. So we learned, we just talked about how to define them in function definition itself. Now how do I use it? So how I use it are something called arguments. Arguments are values. You're going to be sending a value into the function. And in, my, in this case right here, the values will be stored in two different variables, num feet and num inches. So I have Professor Lisa here. She's testing her code. I, I have num feet equals int input, 
num inches equals n to input. So I'm taking two things, I'm taking two pieces of data into the program. Both of them are going to be integers. One's going to be the number of feet, and one's going to be the number of inches. Now, by the way, I named num feet and num inches the variables num feet and num inches and the parameters num feet and num inches the same on purpose. I wanted to, to I wanted to make a point. So I'll be making that throughout this slide. So right now, num feet and num inches. So five is num feet, eight is num inches. Nothing, none of this is new. You guys have done all this before. So now I'm going to call print total inches with num feet and num inches. So what happens? What happens is Python says, okay, I'm calling print total inches, and the first value I'm going to put up is 5 because it's the first argument in the list for the call to the function. And then I'm going to do the same with 8 because it's the second. So now what happens? Well, num feet gets used like any other variable inside the function. Num inches gets used like any other variable inside the function. I print total inches and that's 68. An argument is just a value that's passed into the function. That's all it is. And if I have a variable as an argument, I'm going to take the value outside of that variable and put it in to the function. Right now, a function has to have the same number of arguments as parameters. So two arguments, two parameters, or actually more, more importantly, two parameters and two arguments, because this is what it's going to be, it's going to be evaluated against. For right now, because this will change a little bit in a few slides, for right now, if I don't have two arguments, Python's going to give me an error, and I can show you that error in just a minute. Okay, so one more thing before we actually see this challenge in action. So, got my function definition, same thing we saw on the last page, but I'm going to do something different here. I'm going to swap num feet and num inches. So now I'm passing num inches as the first argument, and I'm passing num feet as the second. So, we're going to do everything else the same. Okay, I'm going to put in five. I'm going to put in 8, 5 is num feet, 8 is num inches because those are just the values of the variables. So what's going to happen now is the 5 goes to num inches and the 8 goes to num feet because it's positional. Okay? It doesn't matter what the name of the variable is, it matters the position in the argument list. So num feet is going to get used as num feet, so it's going to be 8 times 12 instead of 5 times 12. And num inches is going to be 5, so that's going to be 8 times 12 plus 5. So the outcome is going to be different. The outcome here is 101. So understanding that arguments are positional and they can change the order, changing the order of the argument can change the outcome of the function. So if something's not working right, and you're scratching your head, double check that the arguments are in the right order, that you're passing the data where you think it needs to be passed, or it needs to be passed. You might have to change the order of things sometimes. Okay. So, yes. So you need to get the input after you define the function. Yes, functions, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, and I apologize. Functions have to be defined first. That, that function definition has to be before you call it. So my general way of doing things is always to define my functions in Python at the top and then call them later on. So if we go and look at this, let's, this is five, two, three. So this is the print total inches. And you'll see that my function definition is up here at the top. It's not the very, it's not at line one because I have some comments up here. But it is the first thing that happens in the function because if I, it wasn't, I would get an error. So let's run through this and then I'll mess it up and we can see what happens. 
So this is five. Five two three. So let's just run this. Let's in the debugger. Okay. So I'm down here at line nine. Nothing. Nothing happened up here yet. It just stored print total inches. So if I I got an input, so I'm just going to put five and eight. Okay. So now I have print total inches, and I'm going to pass 5 and 8, and that's perfectly fine. I'm going to step into it. Now, the nice thing about PyCharm is when you look up here, it's going to tell you what num feet and num inches are. And notice this when I swap them, and they change. Okay. So I'm going to calculate total inches. Total inches is 68. I'm going to print that out. Now I'm going to call it again with the opposite argument. So I've switched num inches and num feet. That's all I've done. I've just put num inches as the first argument and num feet as the second argument. So if I step in, now num feet is 8 and num inches is 5. It's because it's positional. So I'm going to step over. It's 101. I'm going to print 101. And I'm done. So now let me do something. Okay, I just took it from the top, moved it to the bottom. That's all I did. Python doesn't know what print total inches is. It says unresolved reference. You have to define it before you use it. Python is not one of those languages that's going to read everything in so the order of things don't matter. The order of things matter in Python. So the definition has to be before the use. So if I run this right now, and I put in 5 and 8. I'm going to get a name error. Print total inches is not defined. And that's because by the time it hits line 9, it hasn't been defined yet. So I need to put this back up here. And print total inches is fine now. You see the red lines aren't there. And everything will work. Did that help answer your question, Sandra? Okay. Um, let oh, I never wait long enough. Good, I'm glad. Okay, so now we're going to go to part four. Part four is about returning from a function. It's a black box. It's got goes intos and goes outos. We just talked about the goes intos, which are parameters, and now we're going to talk about goes outos, which is a return. So this is challenge 5.3.3. Define a function, which means I'm going to use the def keyword, pyramid volume, so that's going to be the name of the function, with parameters base length, base width, and pyramid height, and returns the volume of a period with a rectangular base. So let's talk about what we've got here. We've got f, we're defining a function. The function name is pyramid volume. I have three parameters, base length, base width, parameter height. Of course, I've got my parentheses opening and closing, and as always, I have my colon. So the code block is the calculation for the pyramid, and I now have a new keyword. The keyword return says return, the value, return a value to the calling function. So I'm going, whatever that value is, to the right of return, okay? In this case, it's going to be the value in the, contained in the variable pyramid. That, that's what it's just doing right now. So that's what I did. I've added a new keyword called return. Return says, take this piece of data and send it back to whoever called me. Very, it, it's very simple, but that's what you do. So now, ex return is used exclusively inside of a function block. That's pretty much the only time you're going to see the word return. So let's see how it actually works. Okay, I've got my definition. 
I'm going to have handy dandy Professor Lisa. She's going to put in some values for length, width, and height, which is what we're doing right now. So let's see what happens. We already know that length, width, and height are going to be the values that are going to be passed in positionally to our pyramid volume. So length is going to become uh, is 4.5, so base length, base length will be 4.5. Width is 2.1, so base width will be 2.1. Pyramid height, sorry, height is 3.0, so pyramid height will be 3.0. So now what happens? Well, now what happens is that I do a calculation. So base length times base width times pyramid height times 1.0 divided by 3.0. Then I come down and I have return pyramid. Now pyramid calculated out to 9.45. Um, so I'm going to take the value of pyramid for 9.45 and it's going to be set equal to the val sorry, pyramid, the variable pyramid that I created is going to be set equal to the value return by pyramid volume, i.e. 9.45. So that's what this line right here does. It says, I have a variable named pyramid. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side, it isn't just a value, it's a function call. So the right-hand side is call this function and whatever it returns, use that as the data that is stored by the variable pyramid. So that's what this is doing. That's what that line of code is doing. It's like any other uh, variable that you're setting. In this case, what's on the right-hand side just happens to be a function call instead of, you know, length times width times height. Instead of a calculation, it's a function call. That's one of the things that I said, you know, you can name it, and naming it is powerful. This is one of the ways that naming it is powerful, because since I gave my function a name, I can now use it to set the result to a variable. I can use it as input to another function, uh, or um, when we get object, and I can use it um, as a name inside the object. So that was turning the, so this is the definition and we have the goes into us, which are the parameters, and the goes out us, which is the return. So call a function by using its name and providing arguments. Always remember to define a variable before the function call if you're going to use the value returned. Okay, Python and objects. Everything in Python is an object, or just about everything in Python is an object. But functions certainly are objects. Well, what do objects have in Python? They have a type, they have an identity, and they have a value. And the fact that they have a type, an identity, and a value makes them, makes them more usable than if they didn't have all those three properties. So let's just talk about 5.33 here for a second. We have our function name, which is the identity, our parameters, which provide the input value, and our return provides the type. Okay? If it doesn't return, does it have a type? It's kind of yes, kind of no, but it doesn't, you don't care because you're not setting it equal to something. If it has a return value, that provides the absolute type or types of the function. And I'll get to why I said or types in a minute. Scope. Let me double check. Are there any questions yet? Okay. So they are positional like a format function. Yes, Joseph. Actually, that's very good. They are positional just like the format function. Perfect analogy. Very good. 
Okay. So let's talk. Whoops, why aren't you doing that? I don't know why. There it is. All right. So let's talk about scope. Mentioned a couple of times, um, you know, the greater, the greater, you know, inside the block, inside the function, the greater, uh, outside in the greater code. So there are, there's something called scope. And scope dictates when, when an object is available for use. Because not all, not everything's available for use all the time. Up until this week, well, kind of last week, because we started with code blocks, actually in week three, sorry. Um, but code blocks aren't objects. So starting this week with functions, we're dealing with objects. So if we're dealing with objects, we need to think about where they're available to be used. And there are three scopes in Python. There's the local scope, there's the global scope, and there's the built-in scope. The built-in scope is defined and reserved by Python. We're not going to worry about it. Just know that it's there, but it's not going to be on a quiz or anything, so don't worry about it. What's important for us tonight, and for a lot of your programming career, will be local and global. Now, I, I, I put it kind of like a little bullseye because that's some, something similar to what it is. The local scope is included in the global scope. However, the global scope can't really use what's in the local scope. So local is defined inside of class or function. That's all there is. And in, by inside, I also mean parameter. Global is the top level of the program. If you haven't defined a function or an object, and we're not talking about namespaces and modules yet, you haven't defined um, a function or a class or and created an object for the class, then you're talking about the global scope. If you're talking about a function or you're talking about um, a class, you could be talking, well, you most likely are talking about the local scope. So just know that the local scope is very small and very targeted, and the global scope is everything else. So a little bit more about scope. So here's our pyramid function again. So let's talk about scope. OK. The function name is in the global scope, so it can be called from the global scope. The parameters are in the local scope. So they are only usable by the function itself. The process inside the function, all processes inside the functions are local scope. The, the wider, the global scope doesn't know anything about them. The return, while it is still in the local scope, provides access to data from within the function to the call from the global scope. And the call in this case is, well, the call can be from any scope. You can have a function, call another function. You can have a function and call a class method, call a function. You can have a, all kinds of combinations. But as long as the global scope knows about the name of the function, it can be called from anywhere. So, and arguments are data values that are, are data that's available from the global scope, or whatever the scope is, the call is, to the local scope. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about scope. Scope's going to become a little more important later on when we do objects. But we want to introduce it now so that you can begin to think along the lines of scope. Um, arguments and mutability. Okay. So basically, if, if you have an argument and it is mutable in its current scope, so let's say the global scope, then it is mutable or changeable inside a function, and that change will happen automatically to that variable in the, in the, in the calling scope. 
And if it's not mutable or if it's immutable, no changes can be made. So let's talk about what I was just babbling on about. So this is challenge 5.12, and it says write a function swap that swaps the first and last elements of a list argument. So I've defined a function named swap. And oh, I shouldn't have hit that yet. So I've defined a function named swap. It takes one argument, one parameter, has one parameter, sorry, called list to swap. And inside the function, I'm going to define a variable temp, which is in the local scope. I am going to set temp equal to the first value in the swap, in list to swap. I am then going to um, set the first element in list to swap to the last element in list to swap. And then I'm going to set the last element in list to swap to the value of the temp variable. Now, there's no return statement here. So how would print values down here at the very bottom know what to do. What is it going to print? Is it going to print the wrong thing? Is it going to print the right thing? Well, let's figure that out. So Professor Lisa here is she's typed in a list that's here good things just end all. And I apologize. I'm going to stop for a second because I, I left that out here. All right. So let's start that again. So Professor Lisa says I'm going to input a list. And that list is going to be automatically split. So I'm going to call swap, and I have this list here. Now, I want to just swap the last and the first, and that's what this code is going to do. So the list that is going to result from that is all good things just end here. Okay? So now... That's done. I'm done with this function. I'm going to end that function, and it's going to print values. Now, I'm saying that it's going to print all good things just end here. Well, how can that be? Because I didn't return something. It can be that way because lists are mutable. Python doesn't co make a copy of everything. So Python did not make a copy of values. It simply sent, it, sent the address to where that, that list is stored into the function. So when I changed the list inside the function, I was actually changing the list everywhere. Anywhere that, that already had that same area that Python saved with that list in it, they all got changed. Everybody got changed because lists are mutable, so they can be changed. So they're changed everywhere that has that same reference. Now, in some languages, that's called a pointer. Um, in C and C++, that'll be called a pointer. Um, in some languages, it's called an object reference. But it's basically you've got one place in Python's storage bank that contains that information. And what Python does when it calls a function, it does not make a copy. It simply passes the address to that place. So that's the kind of point I wanted to make here. So sometimes you want it to make that change, and sometimes you don't. So you have to remember when you're thinking about writing functions, and calling those functions, whether or not you want to make a copy and call it with the copy, or if you just want to change everything. So, if immutable, they can be changed. Any changes made in the function will be reflected in the calling scope. Okay, so let's go take a look at that real quick. And that is 513. So, uh, 513, number of pennies. That's not it. Oh, I think I... Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong page. Okay, 5121. 
Okay, got a little off track. Okay, so here's my swap. By the way, you're going to have a lab that talks about swapping. And while you're not swapping elements in a list, swapping is still swapping. So this is pretty much the, the flow that you have to use to swap things. So we have defined a function called swap, which we just saw. So let's go through and run this in the debugger because I specifically want you guys to see what happens from um, when you're looking at the variables in the debugger. So I'm going to start debugging this. I'm going to drop off at line 9. I'm going to see variables. Okay, this could be very handy, by the way. So I'm going to step over, and I'm just going to put there. This is just is a lot of words. So, so I can see that I have this is just a lot of words. And if I go to here to frames and variables and I go down to the variables tab, I can say this is a lot of words. So now I'm going to call swap. So I'm going to step into swap. And you'll see list to swap is this is a lot of words. So I am in the scope of the function. I'm in the local scope. So you use no reference to variables here. You will only see list to swap, sorry, to values. Values exist in the global scope. And I just walked into the local scope. So all of the, the value information went away, except for the fact that I have this list to swap because I passed the information to, um, so, sorry, because I've passed the list or a pointer to the list into the swap function. So if I step over, I'm going to make a temp as this, list to swap. I'm going to say words is now going to be the first element. And then um, I'm going to put temp into the last element. So I'm going to have a, a little bit of a Yoda statement. Now, I come back here. I didn't have a return statement. And it says words is a lot of this. And that's because values and list to swap both pointed at the same space in the memory bank. And then I'm just going to print it. So that that's the concept I was talking about for mutability and immutability. So if you did the same thing on a string, if I didn't have the input dot split, I would not get the changed value back because I can't change a string. I can only um, create a copy of the new string. So if you're dealing with strings, always return, always. With that, with that concept cleared on, because it's an important concept, and I, well, I, I wasn't as eloquent as I like to be. So I just double check. If it's not, put something in the comments, and we'll talk about it. So default parameter values. So I said earlier the same number of arg you have to have the same number of arguments as parameters. Well, kind of. I kind of lied. There's this thing called default parameter values. This is something I actually use quite a lot. Now there there are a couple of different ways so that you don't actually have to enumerate every single parameter you might want passed in. One, one is variable arguments, but we don't really do anything with that in the labs. So I didn't really, I wasn't going to spend the time to cover it here. But what I am going to spend the time to cover is something that I do use all the time, and that's default parameter values. So what I have here is I have my function definition. 5.13.1 says, write a function called number of pennies that returns the total number of pennies given the number of dollars and optionally a number of pennies. And optionally means you don't have to necessarily do it. 
So how do I make it so that I can pass one function, one parameter in sometimes and two parameters in sometimes? Well, what I do is I give it a default value. So you'll see here that pennies equals zero is different than what I've seen before. I've usually just seen the variable names. Well, this is in fact saying, hey, Python, this variable pennies for this function, if somebody doesn't pass you a second argument, then make sh set it equal to zero. That's what that's telling Python. So that's what the default parameter value is. And I could have made it 10, but I didn't. I just made it zero. So if I'm going to print the number of pennies, and what we see here is I've got just got a print statement. I'm calling number of pennies inside the print statement, completely legal. I am going to be cha changing whatever I get in to an integer. So there's an input here. So handy dandy Professor Lisa is going to put the number 4 in, um, and that's going to be our argument. That argument's going to go to dollars, so it's $4. 4 pennies is 0. 4 and 0 are going to be 400, and we're going to be returning it. So I didn't have to put in two arguments, but I could if I wanted to. So this is almost identical, except I have a second input for the argument here. Okay? I'm going to put 5 in for one and 6 in for the other. So now I have two arguments that are going to be passed to number of pennies. So 5 is going to be dollars and 6 is going to be pennies. So what that does is tell Python not to use the default value. Just use 6 instead of 0. So I'll use 5 and 6, which equals 506, and I will print it. So that's what a default parameter value does. Now there's something that you have to remember um, that I don't think is, is explicitly clear in Zybooks, and that is any function, a parameter Function, sorry, parameters with default values have to come after parameters that don't have default values. Python won't accept them otherwise. So um, be careful when you code. Um, yeah, that was the last one. So those are the three rules. Um, so a function can have a default value. Um, if a parameter has a default value, you don't have to you don't have to pass in that argument, and default parameters must be listed in the function definition after all the parameters without default. Okay, the other thing. Oh, wait a minute. Let's go back and look at that. Sorry. Uh, let us take a look at. I think that was five point one three. Yeah. Okay, so 5.13 is just what we, we talked about it. So let us debug it. So I'm going to put in the number of pennies here, which is going, sorry, which is going to be 4. I'm going to step over, and it's 400. Then I'm going to step over this, and I'm going to print, put in 5 and 6, and it's going to print 506. And that is because I, I didn't need to have the second one. So that's why I could do the first one. And, and either of these function calls work. So now multiple returns. Multiple returns is very handy. Python is one of the few languages that allows you to return multiple values from a function without having to first create a structure. Okay? So they didn't really have a good example. They didn't really have a challenge for this. 
in Zybook, so I just created mine. And it says move the second element from list one to list two, and move the second element from list two to list one, and return both lists, output the result. So here I have a function, I've defined a function called move it. Sorry about that. Um, I set it in motion. <laughs> so I have a function called move it. Move it takes two um, parameters, list one and list two. It's going to do that swap thing that we did before. In this case, it's just ta and it's just taking an element from list one, putting it into temp var val variable, taking an element from list two, assigning it to list one, and taking the temp and assigning it to list two. And then I'm going to return list one and list two and print them out. So um, I didn't bother to write in all the statements. Three here, four, five, six. Here. So, let's start again, so we can actually see that happen. So, one, three is going to be passed as list one. Four, five, six is going to be passed as list. I'm going to now do my swaps, and that's going to return list one is going to be five, one, five, three, and list two is going to be four, two, six. And so I'm going to print one, and it's going to be one five three. And I'm going to print the second one, and it's going to be four two six. So that is what you can do. And the returns are positional, just like parameters are positional. So it doesn't matter that this is L1 and this is list one. This is the first return in the list of returns, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be sent to L1, and this is the second element to be returned, so it's going to be set to L2. So that is what that does. Okay, they're based on positional, and they're all passed by assignment. Unlike a lot of languages, Python allows for multiple return values from a single function. It's very handy. So now, I'm trying to not keep you guys for way too much longer. Um, Let's talk about the two labs. Now, this is one of those times where I prefer pseudocode to flowcharts. I almost always prefer flowcharts. But when we start to start to talk about functions, functions don't show up well in flowcharts because there's no like flowchart symbol for a function or anything. You just have to know that that's what's happening. So we're doing the pseudocode here. And the pseudocode for 5.1.8 is just talking about swapping. So we're going to have a function. We're going to define it called swap variables. It's going to have two parameters. So I want to swap one. Uh, I want to swap one for two and then return them both. So I'm going to set a temp value to the parameter one. I'm going to set parameter one equal to parameter two. I'm going to set parameter two to the temp value, and I'm going to return them. Now, this is a main function. I guess I didn't address that yet. I apologize. Let's go address main. Main is a special function. Okay? Main is a special function. This is how it, it's got a very special nomenclature. If you want to have a main function in Python, this is how you do it. Um, and basically, it's just if underscore underscore name equals underscore underscore main. So this says start. This is where you start. If you have an if under, under underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals quote underscore underscore main underscore underscore end quote colon, you are telling Python where to start. This is the start button. And then you can do whatever else you want. If you don't want a start button, and you just want it to start running at the very first section of code, that's fine too. But most programs, you want to have a start. And so this is what it is. So this is a specific if statement, and this is the, the, the start button for any program. And I hadn't mentioned that yet, so I wanted to mention that. Okay. So then we have the main. 
And then we're going to have user input equals input of value, user input 2 equals input of value. Set output 1 and output 2 equal to what comes out of the swap values and then print them out. And then here you've got the little bubbles that show you where things are as reference. So you've got 5.2, function parameter, multiple parameters, 5.3, return values, multiple function outputs, um, 5.1, all of that. So that, but that's what 5.18 does. It, that's what they mean by swap. So we've got the challenge that's doing kind of the swapping with variables, and now we're going to have a lab that's going to do swapping as well. Then 5.19, it was too big to fit on one slide, so it's on two slides. So we've done this before, except not with a function, okay? We did this in three, in module three, when we were talking about the exact change. Well, here, what we're going to do is we're going to split things up. We're going to say exact change is now a function. And in that function, I'm going to calculate the exact change. And then in the global scope, I am going to print out the information. So in part one, in this part, you see I've defined a function called exact change. And I'm going to take some user input. Then I set dollars equals user input for 100. And I'm going to set user input equals user input is minus dollar times 100. And you get that. It's the exact same thing. What changes here is the multiple returns. So after all of that is done and I have dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies all calculated out, I'm going to return all that information and I'm going to return it in that order. Dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies. Then I am going to, I've got my, my start button, my if underscore underscore name equals name. And so here, I am accepting my user input. I'm going to set dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, dimes, nickels, and pennies equal to the result of Jack's, of, excuse me, exact change. Boy, did my brain just shut off after 10 o'clock. So this is going to be a variable. It's going to be or five variables, and it's going to be equal to the five variables that are coming out of exact change. And then I'm going to do the print stuff here. So this is just the output stuff that you did before. If you got three right, then all you have to do is take all of those output functions and split them out and create a function for the actual calculation. That is not long, but it's not something I have done before. So that's what I have for tonight. Sorry about that technical difficult earlier. Does anybody have any questions? And in fact, let me just unmute everybody. What about the output functions? What do you mean by the output functions, Joseph? Okay. Oh, so am I still getting distorted again? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, it, it got the story. You were mentioning um, about um, the output functions here. Um, I, I couldn't, I could, I couldn't quite understand what you were saying there when you mentioned that. If you could just um, go over that one more time, I'm sorry. Oh no, it's nothing to be sorry about. So there's goes into and goes out of. There's ways to get information into a function and ways to get information out of a function. So the way to get the information out of a function is a return statement. And the return statement is just the word return. It's a keyword. And you're going to return whatever's after that. It can be a variable. It can be the output of a calculation. It can be a string. But that's what allows information to flow from the function to anything that called it. So that's okay. what the output is. Does that okay. Is that what you were trying to say in the lab there? Is that it was uh, is performing that that, cert, that 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 type of function, the return? Oh, here we were talking yeah. about lab five point one nine. 
Yeah. That's where it got distorted. Okay. So I'm sorry. I it should have been more clear. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's completely Thank you. fine. So what we have here is um, the their, the output or printing, the print statement. So if dollars is greater than zero, you're going to output dollars. Or if it's not, if dollars are equal to one, you're going to output dollar or um, dollars. And then you're going to output, sorry, you're going to output, if they're more, I'm sorry, it's 10, past 10 o'clock and my brain shuts down. So let's just So, I mean, essentially it's the same like it was uh, for that one lab it's that we identical. did. Okay. It's identical to the, to the lab in three. The only thing you're doing different here is you're taking the section where you were doing all the calculations mm -hmm. to get whether how many dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies there are. And you were, um, so you're taking that and then you're putting it into a function. That's what you're doing. And that function is going to return, I just saw an issue, sorry. That function is going to return what you've calculated. So it's going to return dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So this is that okay. multiple return. And then when and, and right, okay, we're going to set dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies to the outcome of exchange. And then you're going to do exactly what you did in three. If you got it right in three, copy and paste it. Put function okay. around it and call it. Okay, so we're just creating so, we're creating that that so we're creating we're uh if I'm understanding, we're creating the function in there underneath the, the depth there, right, to call on instead of like writing all the code out, we're 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 calling we're having to call on that function, right, the defined function. Yes, you're going to call what you've defined. Okay. So this would be def exact change user input and don't forget the yeah. colon. And then you do the calculations. So the calculations part from three, from the lab in, in module three, is mm. the exact same part once you get a, after the function definition. It's identical to the calculations, not the print part, but the calculations part. Mm. And then you have to, the value add here is you have to return all those values. Dollars, quarters, nine, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So okay. that would be the calculation part. And then, and so that's where you would have called that. And then here you're just doing all that printing. You know, if, if you have dollars, you're going to output the dollars. And if you know, to equal the one, you're going to put output the word dollar, else you're going to output the word dollars. I got you. I appreciate you. Thank you. No problem. So that makes a little more sense, Joseph? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate you going over that real quick with me. No, that's cool. That's why I'm here. Um, anybody else have any questions? Okay. I'm going to take that as a no, and I'm going to say good night to everyone. I should have this up sometime tomorrow on the YouTube channel, um, and there will be to the lab pseudocode as well as uh, all of the other. I, I have one more question, if you don't mind me asking. I'm sorry. No, um, the discussion is that I, I'm, it was kind of, uh, if you don't mind, is that uh, is that like a normal discussion due Thursday night, or is that due Sunday? It, 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 kind of confusing it is not, there. It's due Sunday, and you are not required to respond to another student. Okay, I just wasn't quite sure how it was worded there. That yeah, it's it's more like a small paper, you know. Okay. You just get adequately answer all of the things. You don't have to worry about answering the other students or talking about the other students. So that's okay. So it's due Sunday. Thank it's you. Due on Sunday. Thank you. No problem. Have a good night, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording.